Professor Pielo Lumumba, as we said earlier, is the man who convened the Bomber's Talks in 2003 as the secretary of the then Yashpal Gai Constitution of Kenya Review Commission. He has seen this journey towards a new constitution for many years as he has served as chairman of LSK. He has, uh, no, no. not chairman of LSK. He has served as editor <laughs> of the Lawyers magazine. He has been a very senior lawyer in the country. With the constitution now celebrating 13 years, on the day of marking 13 years of the promulgation of the constitution, Professor Pierre Lumumba, among others, called a media conference and said, let's amend this thing. And he had ideas on what needs to be amended. We've invited him to the situation room this morning to tell us more about this proposal to amend the constitution of Kenya 2010. Professor, Karibu to the... Asante sana. Karibu sana. Asante sana. Welcome to the hot seat again. Thank you. City has the day's proverb, and this week's proverbs are from the Republic of... Gabonese Republic. Mm -hmm. Yes, otherwise known to uh, the rest of us as Gabon. Gabon. Mm. Sawa. Yeah, this is the final proverb. Sub from that country, yes. Mm -hmm. The feathers of a dead eagle will not cover you all over. The feathers of a dead eagle will yes. not cover you all over. Yes. Prof, what of do you course. make of it? It is logical. <laughs> when the eagle is dead, mm. the feathers begin to come out and therefore they cannot cover you <laughs> <laughs> why because they're not on the animal they are not on the animal what if you collect the them? life that makes the feathers hang on is no longer in the animal mm -hmm. <laughs> the, fe the, the eagle no longer has its feathers absolutely no longer has life and life is the elixir of all things that cover any animal uh, yes. So what's the deeper meaning? The deeper meaning is that you should not rely on something which has no value and no power and no effect. <laughs> rely only on the living. <laughs> rely on that which has living. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. okay. A nice one. Thank mm. you. Nice one. Mm. So Prof, take us back to this day, the 27th of August, 2023 when you look back at 10 years of the constitution and, this, and you're like let's make this announcement to the people that will be seeking their support in amending the constitution let us remind ourselves that the constitution of kenya 2010 is the product of a long journey we started with the ckrc draft the ckrc draft became the bomber's draft the bomber's draft became the wako draft which was drafted or redrafted in kilifi which was rejected at the referendum in 2005. we then had the post-election violence in 2007 2008 and one of the issues that was recommended by the Kofi Annan initiative was to have a new constitutional dispensation and we had the 2010 constitution and I can still remember the words of the politicians and some of us at that time that this constitution that we are adopting needs amendment even now. <laughs> but we need to pass it so that we have something to begin working on. Mm. And what was the reason why we needed a new constitutional dispensation? To cure bad manners in our politics was one of them. We thought, among other things, that we would have an executive arm of government that whose architecture would immunize the country from ethnic violence and ethnic mobilization. Mm -hmm. We thought that we would have a chapter that would enhance ethical conduct and therefore introduce hygiene in our politics. Mm -hmm. We thought we would have an independent judiciary, a legislature that would deliver, and we thought that we would have men and women included in the political arena arena in a manner that was equitable several years down the line the appetite for amending the constitution for short-term interest has been manifested on a number of occasions it started with okoa movement yep. and then segued as it were into punguza mizigo which i thought was much more long term in its intention then of course segued again into the bbi mm -hmm. and what one sees in all these efforts except the punguza mizigo 
is an attempt by the political class to amend the constitution to achieve short-term political interests. Yeah. And the rest of the Kenyans are left complaining and grumbling. Mm. And that is why we said on the 27th, we are no longer going to agonize, we are going to organize. And we do not claim to hold the monopoly of knowledge or wisdom. We are going to draft a bill that addresses some of the things that we, need, we think need attention and come to the people to seek their support. Mm. And what gives me the strength? I interact with the Constitution very intimately. And I can say that the book that I and Louis Franceschi have written, a commentary on the Kenyan Constitution 2010, is the most authoritative book on the subject. Mm. Speaks to every article of the constitution so as a student of constitution i have both the intellectual wherewithal and firepower mm. to comment on the constitution in an intimate manner and my intention therefore and others whom we are working with is to come to the people and ask them these are the areas that we think need to be relooked at yeah look at the executive we now have offices in the Kenyan administration which have no constitutional basis. Like we Prime mm -hmm. <laughs> cabinet secretary. It has no constitutional basis. Everybody knows that. But we are doing that because we are so highly ethnicized that we think that when you appoint an individual from a particular uh, ethnic group and you give him that title, then the feel-good effect is mm. good for that community. Look at the many commissions that we have. Most of them, you and me don't know what they do, yet they are gobblers of funds in an economy that is suffering. Look at the SRC, the body that we created to deal with salaries. It is no longer independent. It is worked by the politicians and it does their bidding. Look at the offices that we split, such as the office of the Auditor General and the Budget Controller. Should they be merged? So these are the, the legislature. Mm. Look at the number of legislators we have. Mm. Do they serve us? We have seen in times of need, the legislators re prefer to talk at funerals and at weddings and at public rallies rather than to legislate. Look at chapter 6 of the Constitution. We know individuals who have uh, allowed to have committed murder, who are involved in graft, mm. and they are ruling the roost, at, as it were. So while I agree with my good friend Muhisa Kitui when he said that bad manners cannot be cured by political, by constitutional amendments, mm. I believe that the time is now to ask ourselves what can we do to clean up the mess. And the one thing that I did not talk about is devolution. You cannot quarrel with devolution. But the reality, as I speak to you, all counties in Kenya are technically insolvent. Why? Mm. We have too many of them. We have 47 units and 47 governors who believe they are heads of states, of little states. Even if you look at the, the United States of America, which has... a uh, an economy which is 21 trillion, it has only 50 states. Look at China with a 14 trillion economy, only 30 provinces. Look at Nigeria with a GDP of 500 billion and a population of 250 million. How many, what, how many uh, states, states does it have? 37. Look at India. 26. How did we possibly arrive at 47 and we still have appetite for more? We want to create more. So we Before must we be bold enough. We must be bold enough to mm. come to the people and say, this is what is on the table. It may not be palatable, but let us examine it. And look at it. Why now, Prof? Because Why on the 13th year? Why not on the 12th or 11th or the 10th year? That was serendipitous. It is not as if we planned it, but I think it turned out, in fact, to my surprise, that that was the birthday of the Constitution in terms of promulgation. But there is a constitutional moment. There is a constitutional moment because immediately after the 2022 elections, once again, we found ourselves in an environment where the losers of the election, having exhausted the prescribed avenues, have chosen to act extra constitutionally, with the consequence that the country was once again on tenterhooks. And as you know now, we have a process that is going on in terms of negotiation amongst the political uh, contestants. Mm. And one can see, even if one is not a Jewish prophet, 
that one of the things that is going to emerge out of that process is a recommendation for constitutional amendment mm. to resolve short-term political interests. Mm. You wait. Prof, can I ask you yes. on that? Because there will be the rebuttal to this that would we then go towards constitutional amendment anytime there is a for lack of a better word mess in governance a political fallout in po in in politics mm. or when we look at for example the insolvency that you talk about at the county level that should there be a futuristic problem that the answer to that would be a constitutional amendment and they would say how many times will we amend to solve a problem that is created by individuals. Let me contextualize my answer in history. Mm. The history of the Kenyan constitution has been the unfortunate history of amendments to resolve short-term political interests. My good friend Professor Gidham Wigai has written a very good PhD thesis on this subject, on the amendment of the Kenyan constitution. And we started amending our independence constitution, perhaps for good reason, in 1964. Mm -hmm. And we ended up amending this constitution almost 27 times before we went into the process of uh, giving ourselves a new constitution. Is it a good idea to always amend the constitution? Bad idea. Mm. It is a bad idea, but these young countries, which we call young democracies, are experimenting with constitutional dispensations which many times are even alien to our circumstances. And after 10 years, knowing as I do that amending the constitution to address short-term political interest is not a good thing, I think there is merit in examining this constitution in the hope mm. that after we have amended it carefully, it will take us a longer period to do so. If you look at older constitutions, say the Constitution of the United States of America, last amended, I think, in 1971, and not amended more than 21 times, and this is a constitution that is over 200 years old, the reality is that many of these things can be done through legislation. But we have, as a country, entered into the arena in which I call fixation with the constitution mm. things that ought not to be in the constitution are found in the constitution like what for instance you find for example provisions relating to political parties these are things that if you look at other constitutions in the so-called older democracy would not be there issues to deal with ethics mm. how we conduct ourselves they are things that ought not to be in the constitution we have so much detail in our constitution and i can tell you why the typical post-colonial African state is an artificial state. You have in a country like Kenya over 56 ethnicities. And in order to balance the interests which are undercurrent, sometimes you put in your typical constitution things that traditionally ought not to be in the constitution. And that is why we find ourselves going on to amend the constitution. Mm -hmm. I can give you many constitutions which are older than ours. Look at the Swiss constitution is a third of our constitution in size. Look at the American constitution, it's perhaps only, almost 10% in size of our constitution. Look at the Indian constitution, and many of them, but typically African constitutions tend to be very long in order to accommodate all these interests. And the prototypical constitution in that regard is the South African constitution of 1994 and during that period. Look at the Ugandan constitution of 1995, the Ethiopian constitution. All these tend to belong, and we constitutionalize these things because our politics and governance is characterized by ethnic suspicion. Mm. How is this a bad thing? It is not neither bad nor good, because every country must, in the nature of things, do things that address their own specific situation. Mm. But as my teacher, Kotho Gendo, said many years ago, in 1972 to be exact, a constitution without constitutionalism means very little. Explain you, that, please. I can explain. You can have a good constitution. But if you don't practice what it prescribes, mm. then it is useless. Mm. It can have beautiful words. And Yash Gai said it when we were making the constitution that Africa is a graveyard of beautiful, beautifully written constitutions which are honored in breach. Look at our own constitution. <laughs> Look at them. 
Look at chapter 6 and I want you without naming names mm. the individuals who are now in parliament they could very some of them could very uh, quite a good number of them should be in jail mm. fact yes but every time they <laughs> they tell us they tell us what to do they tell us how to behave ethically are we giving meaning to chapter 6 of the constitution no if you look at uh, this uh, the salaries review commission they recommend to us what it is that should be paid to public servants. Do our members of parliament respect all those? No. But Prof, don't you think that the very example you've given mm -hmm. is probably what lends credence yes. to the effectiveness of the constitution in this sense? Mm -hmm. If people preach water and drink wine, mm -hmm. which is in essence what our elected leaders tend to do when it comes to matters of morality, mm -hmm. does it then not shine a very, very bright light as to the reality of what our morality is? <laughs> you know, I, I hear you. You know, we cannot in the nature of things surrender to a situation where we say that we normalize the absurd. No, not this, normalize. Yes, we should not do that. Acknowledge and it for what it is. We acknowledge but don't normalize. Yes. And that is why we try to ensure that through a constitutional dispensation we revolutionize what is undesirable. We have a country today where our creed is greed. Our creed is to do the right things. We have political bad manners as I've said before. And we have had countries in this situation mm. Singapore which we keep on talking about was in this very situation until the administration of Lee Kuan Yew in the 1960s caused people to move in the, di the right direction 140 government officials arrested in a single day mm. Singapore has never been the same again Paul Kagame in Rwanda post genocide through a new constitutional dispensation, did this. In other words, if you have a good constitution and you have political leadership that is committed to ensuring that things ought to run in, this, in a proper way, then a good constitutional dispensation forms a foundation. As it is today, we have within the political class individuals who think they are bigger than the Constitution, mm. who think that they can operate outside of the Constitution. And the time is now to rein them in mm. and to have the courage to tell them, no matter how big you are, you are no bigger than the law. law Constitution. I thought that's what we did in 2010. Oh, so I We thought. created <laughs> institutions. We, in fact, said, let's remove focus on individuals and have institutions. We created institutions and gave them sufficient constitutional power and mandate to rein in these bad manners. Now, why don't we make those ones work? Why are we going back and saying these ones are not working? Because the politicians are winning the game. Now we want to play the game of the politicians? Not, it must not be understood in that way. And sometimes I tell my fellow Africans, we judge ourselves too harshly. These nations that we are running are very young nations. Kenya is slightly over 61 years since it <laughs> regained our independence. If you look at the history of nations, they have gone through this phase. Look at the whole of Europe when they were absolute monarchs, when they killed their monarchs mm. from Sweden to Russia mm. in 1917. They had politicians or monarchs who behaved as demigods. Look at even a country that is running roughshod over Africa, France, until 1958 was in the same situation. Look at Italy until 1900 and after 1945. Look at Spain until very recently. Look at Portugal during 1975. Antonio Di Spinola and Marcelo Caetano. You can go on and on. Look at Latin America. So the truth is that politicians in many parts of the world will always try to test the resolve of the people by running and operating outside of the constitution. What we must do is to have the moral courage to deal with them. Look at what has happened to the former Brazilian president, Bolsonaro. Mm -hmm. He tried to go outside of the constitution and he is facing it. Look at Donald Trump in the United States of America. What he tried to run out of the constitution is facing indictments. Here, when people misbehave, 
their tribe tells you you try and arrest them and you'll see mm-hmm. How this you- <laughs> this is this is the problem and that's why i'm saying prof we yeah. created institutions so we can rein in the politicians yes. now 13 years down the road it sounds like we are exacerbated and we we are basically giving up and saying so let's amend the constitution so we can accommodate you know, sometimes these political bad manners i sometimes so i we wish we can create this position of prime cabinet secretary to accommodate the political bad manners so we can create these positions to accommodate bad manners I had hoped that this administration would would be bolder in in this regard because you need courage but you need bold. courage to do the right thing you can be bold and you are doing the wrong thing <laughs> you can be bold and you are creating sinecure offices look at the offices called CAS one of the things that we were doing during bombers was say we don't need assistant ministers by any name called they have been reintroduced mm. We said we have adopted a presidential system which does not have space for a prime minister. It is presidential. This is what we accepted. Although at Bomas we recommended a totally different system. We had recommended to have a president, a vice president, a prime minister and a deputy prime minister. Does not look sensible, but we said the reality of our country requires some of these officers in order to accommodate these interests. So we are saying this is the time we live in a country where we pretend. We pretend, for example, that we have political parties. These are not political parties. These are ethnic outfits which are run at the behest and on the whims, on caprices of individuals. <laughs> but yet in our constitution, we said we wanted to fund them. We wanted to make them institutional. Yep. But look at your typical Kenyan politician across the political divide. They are migratory. Most of them have belonged to one party, to more than six parties mm. in the last 10 years. So I can hear what you are saying, but I'm saying, let us keep on trying this. Let us keep on trying this. It will not be easy. It will not be easy mm. because the crop of politicians we have now are the very same thing. And I've been alive when they have been doing these things. Whenever we amend the constitutions and we create offices, they see themselves in those offices. <laughs> you create presidency, say, you Nikiti Changu. They you create prime minister, say, that is my seat. Until the day that we have individuals who are capable of looking at the nation beyond themselves, mm. then our constitution will not be respected. Mm. Part of the problem that we have is the current crop of politicians who are so short term, so selfish, so unpatriotic, that they are a danger to this country. And until the day that they leave the scene, this country is always going to converse. I look forward to the day that they leave the scene. That they leave the scene so that we have a new crop of people who think of the future mm. of this nation rather than having their egos massaged. As the good professor was talking about them exiting, mm. I wanted him to perhaps cautiously explain what he means. Mm. Because given the current narratives that we've heard about Vitu Nivitatu. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mambo ni matatu. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> City. I hear you. Eh? But that was on a light note. Morbid as it sounds, but it's on a light note. Everything that we are saying boils down to something fundamental which we keep discussing, and I can't see my way around it. The ability that we ought to have to hold our leaders to account. Mm. We, we we seem unable to do so. In fact, when we refer to something as bad manners, I actually don't particularly like this ter- that term because mm. it euphemizes something worse. Theft is theft. It can't be bad manners. <laughs> mm. Okay? <laughs> when people are committing genocide by misappropriating and stealing money that is intended for health and for education, it's not bad manners. Mm. It, it's what it is. Mm. What needs to be done for the citizenry to understand that these problems that we talk about are within their capacity to actually manage and mitigate against because if they are able to hold the leaders to account believe me they'll behave no city i understand you and eric and uh, ondo the problem we have in kenya and this is true of many african countries is our tolerance for bad things for evil and this sometimes is because of ethnic loyalty. 
so that if somebody is engaged in grand larceny and theft, we excuse them because they come from our ethnic group. And, and the politicians have mastered this art. One of the things that we thought could happen through civic awareness is that the people would be mobilized to be able to recognize evil things. But unfortunately, that is taking too long. Mm. And we must not tire. We must keep on speaking out. We must keep on reminding the people that an individual who steals as a governor and therefore you have no roads, you have no schools, you have no medicine, it doesn't matter whether they come from your tribe or not or from your party or not. Yeah. They are thieves and ought to be dealt with as such. Yeah. Easier said than done. I've had people, some of whom are intellectually very endowed, excuse things because an individual from their tribe is the one who is involved. Yep. So it takes time. It will take mental liberation. And I think that that is what we must keep working at in the hope that sometimes people will begin to recognize that we suffer because of bad politicians. Once we do that, then we'll be able to use the vote because the vote has become so useless in most of Africa that it cannot achieve the desired results. We go to elections whose results are predetermined and whose results are known and mm -hmm. we keep on putting into office individuals who ought not to be in office because they are capable of ensuring that they have sufficient ethnic mobilization or they corrupt the electorate. Mm. I see politicians literally distributing money. Yeah. Live on camera. And people accept it. And nothing, people accept and they are not punished. Yeah. In other parts of the world, when one engages in such conduct by dint of what is the equivalent of what chapter 6 of the constitution, they would be forced to resign mm. the next day. Yeah. But here, they say, I will remain in office and nothing happens to it. And we have very short memories. Yeah. Including you, the media. You have very short memories. You don't ensure that these fellows are put on the spot. Several years ago, I told all media, the print media, you should reserve page three of your newspaper on a daily basis for naming and shaming. Mm -hmm. In the hope that when you keep on repeating it, then they will become, their conscience will prick them. That you who are here in an organization such as every morning, there should be a naming and shaming 30 minutes. I know there'll be laws of defamation and all, <laughs> but you should be prepared to pay the price. It is only when you have such drastic things happening in your country mm. that you can change the country. Otherwise, we'll keep on lamenting every other period. We'll watch the politicians engage in these talks which are designed to achieve short-term political yeah. interests. And, and then I'll the country to that. continues to sink deeper and deeper into the mire of confusion. And I feel, Prof, that we'll keep on making attempts at amending laws, creating laws and amending our constitution without results. Like your professor told you, mm -hmm. uh, Hastings, many years ago, constitution without constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. We as a people have not embraced constitutionalism. And that could be, I put it to you, that that is a problem. That the, prob the, the document that we passed in 2010, much as it may have its flaws, to a greater extent, that document should be able to serve us and to address the ills that we are seeing today. But because we haven't internalized it, we passed Chapter 6, we haven't internalized it. It doesn't matter whether people have gone to court and the courts have said, all right, based on the uh, Leadership and Integrity Act, this person can still end up in the ballot. But we, the people who are the ones who know the character of this individual, end up voting for the same individual with questionable character. Eric, you know, it's us you. who are the problem. The generation that came from Egypt has too much Egypt in them. <laughs> So that even when you physically remove them out of Egypt, Egypt still resides in them. That the is the reality. <laughs> and, and if that is the reality, do we surrender? No. We keep on pushing. It is Fidel Castro during the revolution who said, we'll keep knocking at the door because you know when it will give. It is when you get tired that is about to give. And this is why these efforts must never die. But let us agree that 
throughout history, throughout the lives of nations, yes. these attempts must always be made at all times. And it is true, there is not a single constitution that is perfect. It is the will of the people and the will of the leaders, enlightened leadership and enlightened followership that makes a country move in the right direction. I'm now very reluctant to use the word democracy mm. because it has been bastardized. I prefer to use the word governance. I remember in 1992 at uh, Safari Park, there was a meeting that was called the all, an almost all Kenyan meeting. And Koigi Wawamwere was there. I think uh, he will remember if he's listening to us. And I was there. We were young and exuberant. And I said, Simeon Yachai was sharing the session. I said, we are so ethnic that we had better admit it and then deal with it even if it is dealing with it within the constitution. Because this pretense that we have political party A, B, C, mm. D, and yet we know that these are ethnic political outfits story. pretending to be political parties is only leading us in the wrong direction. If we admitted that we want to constitutionalize our ethnicity and to deal with it in order to solve the problem of governance, that would be a more honest situation. Prof is it done anywhere? Y look yes, at Switzerland. It? Yes. I was about to give the example. Yeah. The, the cantons decided that, look, Absolutely. we know that this is a problem that we have, yes. but we cannot continue getting into a position of conflict. Yes. So if you recognize the problem, how about we make it part of who we are and how we will be held accountable and how we will lead and deal? Acknowledging that issue constitutionalizing it doesn't necessarily take the problem away but what it does it gives you an avenue on how to absolutely deal with it i can't agree with you more that that is acknowledging it then the work begins from there mm. as as they say in kiswahili kuzasi kazi kazi ni kulea Mm. And so it is with the constitution. Having a new constitution in and of self is the beginning of hard work because there are people who will want to resist it. Yeah. They resist it simply because uh, they, they, they don't like the person who started the movement. They resist it because it takes away their power. They resist it because it takes away their privileges. But what we want in a new constitutional dispensation is what is in the best interest of the general good they will always be outliers even in heaven satan is an outlier mm. indeed he is in your proposal you're proposing that we reduce the number of constituencies if i was asked that is one of the things that should be proposed in my mind but the mm. bill that we are drafting is not only me who is doing so but my own desire is that uh, we should reconfigure the manner in which we represent ourselves look at nairobi for example nairobi should not as we recommended at Bomas, be a county. Nairobi should be administered in the same way as Washington DC is, or the same way that Abuja in Nigeria is. Mm. If you do so, Nairobi would not have the problem that it does because this is the capital city. And look at the constituencies that we have with a population representation of 5,000. Of course, the other geographical realities must be put into account. And we must ask ourselves, how are we representing ourselves and who are we representing? We are almost 390 in terms of, if you look at the overall representation, and, and look at other countries which are much bigger. Look at India. Look at the United States of America or even China. So I think that we have too many of these units and they are very costly. Mm. And because they are costly, they take away the resources that we need for education, the resources that we need for health. I would myself love governance to start from the village. That is where the action is. Mm. And once we have the action in what are the villages and the wards, the monies will go there and we'll remove this top layer of individuals whose only claim to fame is to harass in our roads. With so the increase the number of wards from yes. 1,450 yeah. to something else. Yes. But then reduce the number of constituencies from 290 yes. to something below. To something this. else. And reduce also the number of counties yes from 47 yes. to something else in fact we had ourselves in the bomber's draft through the people's interpretation people's uh, submissions and our interpretation recommended between 14 and 18 and you know when i see the governor's meeting and they are saying we are the lake region block 
they are actually saying this is what the county should be. When I see them meeting and saying this is the cost block, they are saying this is what the county should be mm -hmm. because then it has a tax base. But right now as I speak to you, I'm going on a tangent a little. The appetite is to increase rather than to yes. reduce. Yes. And the appetite to increase is informed by ethnicity. Which we must accept, like yes. you said. And that, that, that particular appetite does not take into account that there are certain realities we are operating in the 21st century. And that if you have this top heavy thing at every level, it doesn't help. But if you had a bigger unit where you find the governor, where you find the parliament of the region, then there would nothing be, it would not be harmful to have the current counties yeah. as a subunit of problem, that larger unit. The problem, Prof, yeah. comes again into what you said. The fabric of our nation is very tribal. Yes. Now, if you amalgamate all the counties of the lake region, then it means that there are some communities that will never see the light of day in leadership at the top. And they will feel <laughs> always <laughs> like they are marginalized. You know, marginalization is a very interesting <laughs> thing in, in Kenya. We, we, even when you have, I've had people who are senior government officials saying we are marginalized. <laughs> I mean, it is something that is implanted in our mind. I mean, what does it help me? If somebody from my ethnic group is a prime minister or the president, how? Right. We must liberate ourselves from the thought that an individual from your community holding an office is a solution to your problems. And, and, and once we kill that culture, and we will, not if we are only 61 years, in a hundred years from today, when you are dead, when I'm dead, when City is dead, when Ondo is dead, these things will happen. <laughs> we must not think about problems being resolved in our lifetime. Mm. I keep on telling people, look at the United States of America. When was slavery abolished? 1863. When was the civil rights, when they were doing the American Declaration of Independence that all men are born equal? Were yeah. all men equal? No. no. Blacks were not equal. Women were not equal. George Floyd is being killed in the year 2000 after the civil rights movement. As we speak now even after 500 years we'll still be dealing with these issues and if we accept that i no longer think about things happening in my lifetime i only think think about making my contribution once i make my contribution and people will come in and make their contribution then our children's children we started with 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 a, with a proverb there is a malawi proverb proverb that says more precious than our children are our children's children. Mm -hmm. And I'm suggesting to Kenya that more precious than us and our children should be our children's children. Let us make and have a constitutional dispensation which is not set in stone. They themselves may want to interfere with it through interpretation, not necessarily amendment, mm. through interpretation. And once we do that, then your appetite for seeing things happening in your lifetime reduces. You know, then Prof, your appetite for doing the wrong things reduces. Easier said than done. You know, you put it well. Mm. You put it well. But... The thing that always concerns me mm. as I look at our country and I look at the, the continent when I take my mind uh, beyond our borders mm. is some of the greatest atrocities that we've seen committed in the previous century mm. were committed by human beings to other human beings. Yes. And there's usually a start point. Mm. When we had our problems in Kenya, 2007-2008, it followed similar patterns. There's a word that is actually used when you look at some of those problems that deal with mass violence that is meted on people. It's called dehumanizing. Mm. And there is a language that is used. Experts call it mental state language, mm. meaning you actually don't realize that you're being violated mm -hmm. just by what someone is saying. Mm you don't realize that you're being profiled by what someone is saying. You euphemize wrong 
So you diminish the potency mm. and the sharp reality of what it actually is. Mm. And then over a period of time, you get conditioned. Yes. So now you find yourself in a situation where what you're dealing with every day is a mental denial. Mm. You know it to be wrong, but you figure, well, since everybody seems to think it is okay. Now, everything we are saying with regard to the constitution and the structure that we are speaking of are excellent things. Mm. But the rot that has been set in because of the conditioning which we have allowed to take place over time, we don't realize that actually violence is being meted against us on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. When you accept wrong and you think it is normal, you know, you've been violated to the point where you actually accept when someone is harming you. Because again, as you correctly put it, mm. when someone steals, that money is intended for certain things. And then it means those people will be denied. So what happens to those people? Is that not violence? It's actually being committed. Mm. Someone doesn't have to kill you to commit violence or to be violent towards you. When someone diminishes you because of the community you come from, you are being violated. Someone is actually committing violence. You just don't see it as violence. Mm. And then over time, your condition, you accept that it is okay. And yet it is nothing could be further from the truth. It is not okay. So the consequence is that everything else that comes along, because there's this mental denial, you keep accepting things. You see, now we're talking about constitutional change. Mm. The change that we need is with the minds of our people and our people so that we actually understand that if we don't change, if Prof. PLO and his merry band of men change all these wonderful things, we'll be exactly where we are, if not worse, because we ourselves will not be in a position to benefit from these changes. Let, I, I hear you, Latif and, and, and City. But let us understand, uh, as I, I, I like saying this nowadays, that uh, perhaps when we sit in this forum, people say we are intellectualizing, they are moralizing, <laughs> they are philosophizing, we know them, they have been doing this, let's ignore them. But they should not. Because what we are talking about, we, we in Kenya still have the luxury of doing this. We still have the luxury of having this conversation, the luxury of trying to amend or to deal with these things through discussion and having incremental change. There may come a time when we will not afford this luxury mm. and we must not reach there. And that is the beauty that we have periodically, even in the midst of our problems, always looked at the precipice and said, no, we don't want to go there. Mm. And then we retreat. But... We are tempting fate, and our cup of iniquity will one day be full. So I hear you, but I think it is uh, somebody, I think it is you who said it at one time, that our problem is the software. It is the software that we must deal with, not the hardware. And, and if we deal with the software, it means that we are going to recognize certain things that ought to be done. Talk about uh, the, there is a commission that deals with hate speech. Mm -hmm. and, and, and many times I say, I listen to individuals and I see what individuals in political leadership are saying about other communities. Mm. These individuals ought to leave office until the day that we have the moral courage to call these people out and to punish them. Nothing is going to happen. And I think that it's going to take time before we get into that space because your typical politician has now weaponized their constituency so very badly that if you want to punish them, the weaponized constituency, which is ethnic, is going to cause havoc. And the government and the administration does not have and has not demonstrated the courage. I look forward to the day when you show courage and say liwalo na liwe we are going to use the law and to deploy the law and punish individuals who misbehave prof look at it these leaders we speak of yes i'm agree with what you're saying mm. the people don't see that the very problems they have are caused by these people unfortunately not somebody else no 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 not <laughs> someone from a different place <laughs> the situation you find yourself in this very person you're protecting mm. is the one who has brought about these problems uh, he or she and their ilk which is my frustration yes. yes we then using experts such as plo and others identified this and said let's have institutions yes that would help us first of all to understand that these are the ones that are causing the problem by holding them accountable 
You've just talked about the Integrity Commission. There's the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission and all these other commissions, the Commission on Human Rights. All these commissions are supposed to show us by example that you know what? This person has violated your rights and this is the consequence. This person is uh, spreading ethnic hatred and causing discord in our communities. This is the consequence. This person is violating Chapter 6 of the Constitution. These are the consequences. But then these commissions, like you've said, it's like they have no power, yet they have power. Yeah, but look at, I'll give you a good example, the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission, which mm -hmm. gave its report nearly 10 years ago. Right. The Ndungu Commission. All of these things are not implemented. And, and, and the reason is the political leadership loves it this way. It is Malcolm X who famously said that your tormentor no longer needs to torment you. He has taught you how to torment yourself. <laughs> and you do it gleefully. And, and, and this is our problem. Until the day we are able, and that is why some of us never get tired. We never get tired, even if we are lonely voices. We keep on speaking what we are speaking. It irritates others. It annoys others. You are accused of many things, but you keep on saying, let me keep on. Let me keep on in the knowledge that one day it is going to ensure that change. It is Wangari Madhai who talked about the hummingbird. It keeps on bringing the water, bringing the water. It will not fill the ocean, but it contributes to filling the ocean. And I think that that is how we should look at it in this country. Make our contribution and be bold. Mm. Even in an exercise such as this where our language is very tame, we want to invite the people to talk. We already have uh, detractors mm. who are coming on us, hammer and tongues. Yeah. And they are not doing so by force of argument. They are doing so possibly because they don't like the faces of some of us. But I'm saying ignore the messenger. Look at the message. And if you demonstrate to us by force of argument that what we are saying has no merit, a good argument will prevail over a bad argument. Uh, but we must, in the nature of things, ask ourselves, mm. what are we doing? Because city, let if no. You know, there is a meeting that is going on at Bomas. Yeah. Mm. And you know that meeting from, the, the, from what we see on the table? Mm. You see that this is a meeting whose agenda is to ensure that uh, we create jobs for the boys and the girls. Yep. <laughs> Shouldn't we be involved in that space and tell them we don't want jobs for the boys and the girls? We want changes that will ensure that the Kenyans, Kenyans. have good health care, mm. education, and all these. You boys and girls, we are not going to give you jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and you have started the journey. <laughs> Professor, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Pielo Lumumba and others are drafting some ideas on areas that we could consider amending to our constitution when it's ready bring it thank you let's discuss it and let's have these conversations going yes even the bomas conversation let's keep watch at the boys and girls and yeah. the jobs that they <laughs> <laughs> creating for themselves <laughs> and That's some 10 billion shillings for unga <laughs> this is the situation room the only way to start your day